Right, hi everyone. Um, I am the Shane Shelby Champion. Uh, my friend and colleague, Stefan. We're going to talk about, um, we called it privacy, transparency of data ownership, but what we'll probably find is we're going to kind of probably move closer to uh, data usage and the usage of that data. Obviously, ownership is part of that, but uh, we'll see as we kind of go along. And also, what we felt is having heard a lot of the other talks here today, these sides and stuff. See the talks can be quite technical, so we thought kind of change of pace, maybe kind of a bit more, more of an overview, conceptual, conceptual type stuff. Um, well, we just thought we should explore exploration, but yeah, just kind of explore some of the, some of the realms around uh, data usage, data ownership. So, uh, who are we? Uh, yeah, so like I said, my name, um, recently done uh, an MSc in cybersecurity, but my background is in uh, is in intelligence. Uh, I won't go into the ins and outs of that, but let's just say that I've been in this realm for quite a while, uh, mainly digital forensics and intelligence. Uh, this is how much work, that kind of thing. After my MSc um, in cybersec, I'm doing the uh, cyber warfare and cyber uh, cyberspace and security, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I've been doing a lot more research, published some books and things. Um, now fellow at the uh, Boss Society, right, which is a quite nice thing, looking at kind of social enlightenment, social critics, and how cyber kind of things with society change, I suppose. And then of course, men do IET. So um, I did the same thing. Yeah, thanks, Dishan. So, yeah, I'm Stefan. So, actually, I'm more kind of industry. So, you know, over the last number of years, I've worked in telco, worked in software, worked in uh, finance uh, systems. And more recently, kind of, I'm working a lot with uh, spread of publishing associations uh, who want to get their message, their content out there to a global audience. And, uh, yeah, we're, we're a technology partner. We partner with those type of organizations. And, and you know, on this global basis. So, I also do a bit of work with the uh, yeah, UK BVI, so disaster victim identification, so just more on the process of, on post mortem. So, kind of like a uh, methodology well, on incidents uh, after you know, certain uh, aspects So, similar to Nishan, um, you know, Master Cyber Security, I found that. For me, that was just a great thing to do. It just sold up a lot of my industrial kind of experience in different, you know, different sectors. And cyber security is a word that covers many different things. And for me, it just was uh, was a great thing to do, even at this point in my life, let's say. So, you know, education is so you're never too, too old to, to start that game. So, um, yeah, I published a few things, you know, articles and journals. And there's a book coming out as well, that's uh, blockchain and, you know, uh, clinical trials and tri privacy and transparency of that data. Uh, similar uh, fellow of the RSA and MIET. So, yeah, I mean, we're just here really just to um, kind of just give that, uh, allude to in the beginning, that idea about cross everywhere, really, privacy and transparency of, of data ownership. So if I hand you back to the and then we can, we can duck in between. All right, so we thought, if we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about data, privacy, data ownership, um, background of data. I mean, kind of features. So, I'll, as I understand him, kind of read the whole PowerPoint and talk about the facts there and some of the stats. Z device has to show you, is it fast and safe? Is it Huawei figure? Um, that's the total amount of data that they've used and generated um, on so um, And when you're looking at the breakdown there, I mean, it's your usual suspects that you face with uh, WhatsApp networks, green services, social media, um, some of the others, really. Um, what's interesting about a lot of these agencies is how is it going to be used? What are companies going to be doing with it? That's kind of what we're going to maybe explore today. Uh, Just to kind of think about how data is being used, I suppose. 
So we can't talk about data and how it's being used without brushing upon Industry 4.0 as well. Um, again, something that I'm, all, I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, we talk about, <clears throat> well, if you think about Industry 3, or the third revolution of industry, uh, digital revolution, I guess 4.0 is more geared around automation and integration of automation um, around processes, everything from the Internet of Things, cyber-physical systems, uh, robotics, nanotech, uh, yeah, quantum computing, how how everything is effect effectively going to change, and we're seeing it already. Um, a lot of this stuff is happening now. A lot of it is due to come, like 5G autonomous vehicles. Um, so really, society and, I guess, the way we do things is changing. Our usage of data, I suppose data is perhaps changing the way society operates as opposed to society changing the way we generate data. So <clears throat> moving on from industry 4.0, we then look at uh, what is data ownership. So again, data ownership, a bit obvious really, but if you look at it legislatively, I suppose, if you're the owner of data, you're going to have, or ideally, you want to have complete control and legal rights over the back piece of specific piece of data. And that's what it kind of says leg uh, legislatively, I should say. But that also means that you can create, um, yeah, edit, modify, and restrict that access of that particular data. So you give permissions to whichever organization it is that you're giving that data to. Um, and at the same time, legislatively, you, sh you, sh you, know, you can surrender these rights or share these rights with other, part other parties when you, when you sign up your um, <coughs> terms and conditions or you know you, uh, accept, you, know, you accept the, the permissions to use a, a particular platform, you usually give them rights to use your data. But again, this is something we're all aware of and again, so I didn't, trying to identify data owners again, that's, an, that's a big kind of thing right now because with this big mishmash of sharing rights, giving permissions, who actually owns data that's being generated. It's easy to say, well, I am doing X, Y, Z function, and therefore the data that's generated off of that is mine. But is it actually mine? And if it goes to a platform, does the platform own it, or do they just use it? And if they share it, you know, where, 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 where is the permission coming from? And is there an implied permission to that? And it becomes like quite a, a quite complicated legislative kind of uh, conundrum, really. Uh, we're talking about, well, a monopoly. One of the things to talk about with monopolies, well, I've, I've put not the game there, meaning if we're, to, if we're talking about data, data generation, data ownership, and if I use an example of Google, and you know, whether it's your Gmail account or your Google search history or whatever it might be, and if you think of Alphabet Inc. that own Google, but then all of the other kind of subsidiaries under Alphabet Inc., so straight away, if Alphabet Inc. have quite a few... Uh, I guess different uh, facets or different kind of tunnels that you're generating data and giving data to. Um, we'll say that this, as an organization, they become very powerful because suddenly they've got a lot of data that they can be doing or some of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, shortly. So yeah, monopolies. Uh, really, data is becoming the, the gold mine, or well, not the gold mine, but the kind of the currency, the new oil, I guess, of the, uh, of the cyber world. I had a video here to show you about um, a project. I don't think it's going to load, but we'll see. Uh, Sidewalk Labs. I'm not sure if anyone's aware of the work that Sidewalk Labs are doing in Toronto. I'm seeing lots of blank faces, so I'm assuming not. Sidewalk Labs. They're essentially, they were a startup that were bought by Alphabet Inc., again, Google. Um, their idea was to create, or they are creating, a neighborhood within Toronto that's going to be effectively a smart neighborhood. Um, monitoring everything, facial recognition, um, using... Uh, uh, what's the word? But basically, with 5G and all the other networks and things, using biometric tracking, uh, behavioral analytics, all sorts of stuff. So, when you're in this neighborhood, their idea is that by tracking you and your data that you're generating, everything that you're doing, they can provide a better service and provide targeted infrastructure and whatnot. Obviously, there's a massive privacy uh, kind of connotation to that, and perhaps even an ethical, an ethical kind of thing that we'll uh, that we can talk about. Um, I had, but I had a video that was the you know, one of these glossy promotional videos to say how wonderful the world will become if we all share our data and we all kind of share what we're doing. Um, oh, it might actually work. And just while, while the show's doing it, that, that ties into that first slide with all that data landscape, right? I mean, it says there are 10 times the data by 2025. So if I was to know this, I'd be aware But one interaction every 18 seconds, you know, I'm looking at the following, and I'm 
or something to do, but you know, it's, uh, that's what this is about. It's not about you, it's about it interacting, actually, you have no choice on it. So, you know, there's going to be 4,800 interactions a day on IoT, internet things, whether you like it or not. So, this is actually a really interesting project. I mean, that uh, obviously is out there, that uh, that was in there. Yeah. Let's see if it pays. Some poor glass. <coughs> Got to put it on when Kelly's version of the audio I put it on speaker out. Speaker out might be one of the other ones. Sorry about it. Stand by. It's all right. It's, it's not pretty. It's, 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 it's not. It's not. <coughs> but yeah. Yeah, like I say, I mean, essentially, if you look up uh, sidewalk labs, it's quite interesting. They're using these, uh, you know, free Wi Fi. You know, for, for everyone, you know, by all means, free Wi-Fi, do what you want on the Wi-Fi, and uh, whilst we kind of mine your data, um, obviously, they're looking at it from a very kind of utopian point of view. I look at things from a data profiling, I guess, side. Um, I guess as security experts, we kind of have to be quite critical, quite sceptical about these sorts of things. Um, I'll skip along if there's no sound. Again, it's it, it's not mission critical. It was just, it's just an, inter an interesting concept as to what's, What's going on? And on the adverse, well, I guess on the other side of the spectrum to sidewalk labs in Toronto, um, obviously there's the work that's going on in Shenzhen at the minute in China with um, facial recognition and automatic, uh, well, essentially in Shenzhen, I'm not sure if anyone's been to Shenzhen in China, and you, but you guys know the offense of jaywalking, don't you, if you cross the road on, on a red man. So if you've got, you, you come to a pedestrian crossing, red man, green man, so you cross the road or you wait until the traffic light changes. If it's red and you cross the road, Facial recognition identifies you. It knows you've crossed your road. They get your details from WeChat and they automatically bill you and fine you and you get your criminal record and everything and it notifies you on your phone. But by the time you've crossed the road, it's all done. And so that, that's China. But like I said, it, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of the, uh, dark side of looking at that kind of data collection. So yes, yeah, so, I mean, Steph alluded to it. I probably missed it on the first slide, but when we're talking about Data again, data collection points. So I'm talk I keep I keep throwing out talking about uh, the data that we're generating. But when we think about data collection points, we're talking about you know, oh, sorry, I had a bit of a search there. Um, we're talking about uh, that's tending to throw me off. Uh, data collection points. So we're talking about what you know things that your phone generates. So location history, your search history, even IoT devices, listening devices, that kind of thing, right? So these are the sorts of data. I mean, you, I, I can stand here and give you a one-hour lecture on data collection points. It's going to be really boring, so I'm not going to do it. Um, big, big data again. That's, I mean, big data now. I mean, it, it, it's it's metadata, right? It's it's all sorts of things that we are generating in terms of our listening habits, our driving habits, our consumption habits, what we buy food, where we buy food, what times we buy food, what time we leave the house, what time we go to work, who's in our household, you know, medical conditions, medical data, all, everything you can think of. Um, biometrics, how we do things. There's some interesting research on biometrics. Um, one particular one that I was looking at recently was. Um, eye tracking on your computer. So if you're sitting in an office space and you're doing your work uh, and you've got your Word document up and you don't want your boss to see what you're doing because you're actually playing something else, using the camera they can monitor your eye tracking movement to actually correlate that with what's on your screen. So are you actually reading the document that's on your screen or are you doing something else? I mean, that's just a very, very kind of breezeway through it. Or looking at, uh, I guess, Walking movements within office. If your if your manager leaves the office and suddenly everyone's walking to a particular area, or you're going to see a particular person somewhere else in the office that you might not necessarily be dealing with in your everyday kind of operations, why are you going to see that person? I mean, you can look at it from an insider threat kind of point of view, as so, to you know behavioural analytics again. But again, it's a sort of tracking, and it's a sort of stuff that um, now is being looked at. It's the data. It's data that's already been collected, but now it's, they're finding uses for it really. Um, Social data or social media uh, data misuse. You know, we're talking about Cambridge Analytica and stuff, which Stefan will talk about later. Um, and again, and we go on about key key logging. Uh, third part third party keyboards is an interesting one. I, I mean, anyone here who's got a Google phone, like a Pixel, um, and you've got your what they call a G board. If you go into a Google account, you can actually look up all of the words that you've added in your dictionary and look words that you've actually typed within G board. So it's quite 
worrying really that to think that actually everything you ever type is being stored somewhere. Just food for thought. Um, so yeah, which leads on to what do your devices know about you? So yeah, every place you've ever visited, everything you've ever told someone. Obviously, we've got Siri, Google, uh, that kind of thing, all of your standard kind of things that you think of. But when you really kind of start deep diving and thinking about what do I actually have on my phone, whether it's my credit card information or you know my emails, my text messages, my WhatsApps, my usage, maybe my tracking data, when I'm going, you know, what, when I'm traveling here from where I live and I'm looking on my Google Maps or I'm using my you know, Virgin Trains information or once I get here and I use my Uber to get to the hotel or trying to walk here and whatever, right? So all sorts of kind of profiling data, building that wider data kind of picture about someone. So when we move on from that, we kind of enter the realm of data profiling, which is uh, kind of where I'm, well, one of my hats, I suppose. Where, uh, again, so you start thinking about data points and metadata, the, the stuff that we're kind of generating. And as a data profiler, if I want to profile a particular individual, I want to know what makes them think? What are they doing? Obviously, I, I, you know, it depends on why I'm profiling them, but I need to know what they think, what they're doing, what, what their likes and dislikes, so I can kind of get a psychometric profile from them to analyze them for a particular reason or way. So now we have a treasure trove of things. We've got social media activity, uh, your likes and your shares on Facebook, straight or, or any social media. I know straight away what sort of things you like, what sort of things you don't like. I mean, that could be political. It could be just general kind of events. It could be your favorite movies or your favorite music or whatever it might be. Your status updates. What are you thinking about? What are you doing? You know, your check-ins. Where, where are you? I mean, Strava. I mean, everyone knows Strava, the fitness app, right? And they knew about that issue last year about the actual mapping of military bases through Fitbit. So I don't need to go into that. Um, again, internet search history. That's a scary one. Um, I won't, I won't go too much into that, that's pretty much self-explanatory. YouTube, Twitch, again, what videos you watch, who you watch, you know, uh, what, what is it about those particular videos that you, you like to watch? Pornhub search history. I don't know what Pornhub is, maybe someone might be able to explain to me, I don't have, I've, I've no knowledge of Pornhub whatsoever, but I hear that, you know, based on people's Pornhub history, I mean, can you imagine? Looking at pornography without going too much into detail is a very private thing, right? You do it at home behind closed doors. Can you imagine what someone can do with the information if they knew your pornographic likes or dislikes? In terms of thinking of from a psychometric point of view, right? Very, very scary when you think about it that way. And then couple that with your Amazon search history, your gaming likes, something else. So, so we're not just talking about whether someone is you know, your basic kind of psychometric stuff now. We're, we're really kind of getting those really valuable deep, dark kind of indicators, those data metrics about an individual that we can really, depending again on which way you look at it, whether you really want to investigate them heavily or socially engineer them for a particular reason. I mean, obviously, if you're looking at it from a law enforcement or an intelligence point of view, if you want to get an individual or want more information on that individual. Uh, PUBG, I mean, I put PUBG up there. Everyone knows Player Underground, Battlegrounds, right? You know, they're like the COD online but the battle royale type thing. Um, that's an interesting platform, actually. It's a it's an intelligence tre treasure trove. I'll just put it that way in terms of people's conversations within those servers and stuff. I won't go into the sorts of stuff that goes on in there and the sorts of things that discussion that, that are discussed on there. But we're talking about dark web transactions, terrorism, counter, you know, that kind of stuff. It's quite it's quite scary what people are saying on there and what. You know, and who's listening. Same with Fortnite. You'll be surprised at the sorts of people that go on Fortnite and what they talk about. That's all I'm going to say about that one. Uh, free use platforms. I think one of the other talks mentioned this before. Are they actually free? Well, well yeah, I mean, they're, they're free, but uh, you know, you're, you're, they're free because you're giving them your data. Otherwise, what's the point? So from there, you, I've spoken about all these data sets and uh, sources. So building psychometric profiles. And I put Spotify me there, or Spotify.me. Is anyone aware of Spotify.me? Probably not. Oh, one. Good. Of course it's for you, but yeah. So if I I'll put that up. So we all know what Spotify is, right? Yeah. I'm a heavy user of Spotify. Um, I can't leave this invisible wall here because of the camera. But um, oh, I've got one of these magical pens, haven't I? So, 
this was as of January, so again, your daily mix is a bit obvious. You think, yeah, I listen to music, and Spotify learns the sorts of music that I like, and I listen to, and it builds a profile, and it kind of says, oh, you know, your daily mix, one, two, three, four, depending on your mood. So lots of things there, from Dean Martin and Bing Crosby, uh, all the way to some movie soundtracks, to Max Richter, and, you know, kind of showing different facets of my personality, right, as to what I like, what I dislike. And yeah, that's helpful for me because I want to just click on a daily mix and I know I'm going to listen to that kind of music and fantastic. Great. So why don't we do a bit of a deeper dive though. So we've got Spotify, which is your music streaming service, which is free. Yes, it is free, but you get ads or you pay for your premium service. And then there's Spotify for brands which is essentially what, Spot, what Spotify are doing with that data that they're collecting, you know, selling it to brands effectively. I won't say what brands and I won't say who is buying that data, but it's not just advertisers, I'll put it that way. So if you go on Spotify.me, it's actually essentially like a, I guess a, I say public, but a user kind of front so that you can potentially access, or you can access your more limited amounts of your Spotify profile to actually see what sort of data and psychometric profile that they've actually gained off of you, or gained from your uh, listening habits. So I kind of did that to myself, just have a look. So it came up with, based on the music that I like, it's really hard to read, so I'll have a look here. It says, stay chill, according to your streams, it looks like you're into coffee house rather than house. All you need is a guitar, mic, and maybe a latte. So I'm a chilled individual based on my music. I mean, I know, I like to think that I come across as a chilled individual. Maybe it's not coming across right now. But then, looking again, it says, keeping it 100 here. So, damn, you like a lot of energy. Based on your listening, we guess you'd use music to soundtrack your workout and party moments. So, two, two slightly different sides of me there, but I would say, to be honest, that's, that's quite accurate, because I like to, li as, as you saw from the Daily Mix, I, I listen to lots of music depending on my mood. And bearing in mind that this is just a very, very scratching the surface of the sorts of things that they're getting. And then we go on to um, the time of day that I listen to music. Straight away you think, well, yeah, okay, I listen to music more at 7pm and maybe midday, but there you've got a little spike between 4 and 5am, and this was taken January 28th. Uh, well, this was collated on January 28th, so I can probably tell you now that around that time I was doing some work in the middle of the night and I was probably finishing work in the middle of the night and coming home. So, um, interesting that that's on there, really. And there, there is a little, I'm not sure if you can really see it there, Ooh, sorry. but there's a little location thing there, so you can see your timings based on other locations. So again, looking at it thinking, well, I listen to music at what time, you know, those sorts of times, why is that interesting? But then again, like I said, I can gain all sorts of information on that coupled with other things. So if you're listening to music at a certain time based at a certain location, is that where you work? Is that where you're, you know, are you coming home at a certain time? Yeah, that builds a picture of your, your working habits or your daily habits, your daily routine. What sort of music do you listen to at certain times? Maybe when your significant other leaves the house, you blast out, you know, thrash metal and go crazy. But then when you're partners in, you, you're keeping calm or whatever, you know, that, again, so building psychometric profiles, it's, it's quite worrying really, like, like I said, this is a very, very s s kind of surface scratch as to the sorts of information and the sorts of profiling that um, Spotify are using. One of the things I will say with Spotify for brands is that they're using this information to give to insurance companies. So for argument's sake, if you're driving your car and you, let's say, I'll give you, I'll give you a hypothetical scenario here. You are driving you ca your car and you have an accident, you, you, you crash into someone, no one's hurt, but damage only, whatever it might be. Wouldn't it be interesting if the insurance company could review this kind of data and suggest, well, at that particular time, you were listening to music that had a, an average beat of 145 beats per minute, therefore your heart rate was increased, therefore your sinking perhaps, or if it was like a thrash metal or whatever it was, that indicates that your thinking at the time might have you know, might be in line with a certain psychometric profile, therefore you may have taken more risks, so actually you may have been more liable for that accident, therefore we're going to void your insurance. Stunned silence, or just, uh, maybe I'm losing people, I don't know, I'll move on. Um, again, like I said, this is just food for thought here, it's kind of thinking about a lot of things that are, that's, that are, you know, a lot of things that are kind of going on now. So we move on to 
listening devices, you know, fantastic AI assistants. I ask my Google assistant all sorts of things all the time about what the weather is and, you know, random questions. And it usually gives me the wrong answer because it never understands my voice. Uh, but yeah, I mean, same thing. I mean, if, again, if you've got, if you've got a Google listening device, a Google home, um, you can go onto your Google account and actually look through your entire history and see, and go through the recordings of everything that you've ever asked it. You can play back the recording, which they say it's used for their, you know, their voice algorithms and, uh, and all the rest of it. But it makes you wonder if you play back that and, and the whole passive listening thing. Oh, you know, what else are they recording? What are they listening to? Yes, they might kind of assure you with data privacy and GDPR and, and whatnot that, you know, they're only recording and they're only keeping certain snippets. But again, there are plenty of examples that you can find online, um, through Amazon Alexa and stuff where, in, where conversations have been recorded and sent on to employers inadvertently, or there's been actual police investigations using things that have been recorded through smart TV devices. Um, there was, uh, hypothetically, yeah, hypothetically, I will say, um, a group of individuals that were planning something uh, in a particular country, uh, something not so nice, and they were discussing it in front of their Samsung TV, and it was all recorded on their smart listening to, on on the smart TV, and the authorities were alerted. I mean, obviously, that's I mean, there, there was a lot of other kind of stuff going on there, but I'm not suggesting that all of you guys are scheming horrible things at home, but it's just that now everyone has a set of ears in their house. So um, I put speech analysis there purely because of we've all heard that line when we call um, you know if we call up I don't know if I call up Sky and I'm wanting to change my package and you hear the whole this call will be mon you know recorded for monitoring and marketing purposes or whatever it might be what they're actually doing now is using speech analysis to um, again profile you to determine you know, if you're in a bad mood or not, you'll, I find if I'm waiting on hold, I might just kind of talk calmly and I'll actually get an operator who is nicer to me. It sounds a bit strange, but if, you, if you're if you on hold and you're there cursing and, oh, for goodness sake, I'm whatever, more than likely the person when they pick up the phone is going to be quite standoffish with you because they've been alerted that this, you know, this customer's not happy. Also, if you're calling up about your insurance policies and that kind of thing, again, they, they'll be profiling you based on your conversations and how you're interacting and, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, there's a lot of Again, that's a, there's a massive deep dive that we can go into that, which we won't because we just don't have time. Um, and household routines, again, knowing what you're doing in a house and who you're doing it with and what you're doing at certain times and that kind of thing. So obviously this is all scary. And you think, you know, now we're at this point where we're thinking everything I do is being monitored and used against me. I can't say anything anywhere without somewhat, you know, a phone or some device picking it up. What am I going to do? I'm just going to put my tinfoil hat on and wrap myself up you know, in Faraday material and, you know, hopefully no one will track me. So, I mean, I don't need to talk about VPNs because we all know what VPNs are, so I can kind of skip, I'll, I'll, I'll literally just skip that slide. And obviously when we talk about VPNs, that's just securing, you know, the tran you know, the, the data transfer, right? It's not actually, you know, we're talking about what the companies that, where the data is going as opposed to it being intercepted in transit. So, again, so we've talked about how a company, well, how a company is storing data, metadata for profiling. That's the big one. Profiling and metadata, everything we generate. It's not, you know, everything and anything you can think of. When you're buying your supermarket shopping and using a Tesco club card, the very reason that you've got loyalty club club cards is to profile what you're buying, where you're buying them, and you know, selling that information to advertisers. Um, you're browsing and you're purchasing data again online for advertisers. I'm sure, I mean, it goes from the basic thing on Amazon where you buy a book and it says other users, you know, have bought this based on that. Or it might be, I'm not sure if some of you have noticed it, but I notice it sometimes if I'm talking about a particular subject when I'm at home or somewhere else. The next time I go on my Amazon app, strangely enough, it's suggesting that, you know, there's this particular book or there's this particular item that I might be interested in. And I just so happened that I was talking about it a couple of days ago. That's really worrying. Um, but again, and then you kind of go into the conversation of, well, are they actually helping me and suggesting things that I want, or are they kind of almost uh, grooming me to want certain things? And there's an interesting TED talk about that, about a chap who was using those sorts of techniques in advertising where they're actually grooming people to buy. Instead of th suggesting to you that you want a pair of these shoes or these shoes are really nice and you might like them, it's almost as though these are the shoes that you need. They're creating the demand for the shoe as opposed to following, you know, following the demand for the shoe, if that makes sense. I mean, they use the shoe as an example. So yeah, so we're going into data misuse. Does anyone know about Uber's God view? 
You know, it's not really a pub. It's, well, it's not a publicly accessible thing. Essentially, with 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 Uber, um, internally, I suppose their uh, their employees can access the, the Uber tracking systems. So they can see all of their Uber driver drivers and all of the users and where they are. And there was a bit of a misuse issue when a, a reporter was due to be meeting with an Uber executive and was late for the meeting, so an employee accessed the system to see where they were. Um, Uber states and claim that um, they only use it for legitimate purposes and whatnot, but the fact that that is accessible is a bit of a concern because, again, anyone that has the Uber app can be tracked. Google DeepMind and the Royal Free. They want to know about that kind of misuse of data sharing. No? Okay. The Royal Free uh, Hospital in London. Uh, obviously, lots and lots of medical records and patient data. They decided that they would work with uh, Google DeepMind and share 1.6 million patient uh, records with DeepMind for, as Google say, legitimate research and kind of uh, analytical purposes. But there was an assumed consent. It, there were, you know, patients weren't asked, would you like us to share your data with whoever? I'm not sure many patients probably would have agreed, but the fact it was just there was an assumption of, well, it's our data, we'll hand it over. Um, so there was a bit of a boo-boo there. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, everyone knows about that, so I won't really talk about that. Third, I put third-party permissions and frenemies there. That's an interesting concept. Third-party permissions, we all know a big one with Facebook. They used to have the, uh, I mean, we talked about data ownership, right, and transferring ownership to um, other parties, you know, through consent or whatever. And with third-party permissions, if you think of anyone on Facebook, have you ever had one of those uh, quizzes that says, find out what your Lord of the Rings character is, or, you know, what, what, what day of the week are you? And then you go, oh yeah, I want to find out, you know, if I'm Gandalf or if I'm Frodo. And you, and you click on it. And the first thing it pops up is, do you give whatever access, you know, to see your profile and da da da. And most of the time you just click, yeah, right, whatever, because I want to find out that I'm Gandalf. So you, you click on that and they get access to your contacts or your, your profile. And you do your quiz and you find out that, oh no, you're Sam, you're not Gandalf. That's a bit sad. And, uh, and you forget about it and then you move on. But then you forget that that permission is still there. And you, and you can deep dive in your Facebook settings and actually see all of the permissions for all of these historic apps. And even recently, like uh, Farmville was one that haunted me a long, long time ago. Um, but yeah, that's the sort of stuff that they're, gener they're creating these kinds of quizzes and things to get access to your Facebook details. I know a lot of people now are a bit more savvy to it, so perhaps it's not as big of a thing. Um, and I put frenemies there purely because an interesting... So, how do, again, I've got to be careful about how I'm saying this because it's being recorded. Um, in an open, it was talking about OSINT earlier, open source intelligence. And let's just say hypothetically, that's going to be my magic word for today when I say hypothetically, because it might not actually happen, but who knows, maybe I'm telling the truth. But um, hypothetically, back in the day of, you know, early Facebook days where everyone was rushing to get, you know, how many friends can I get? Oh, I'm, I'm eating into your time, mate, sorry. Um, yeah, how many friends could people, how many friends could people, uh, have? And they're kind of accepting everyone and this, that, and the other. So, th let's just say that potentially there could have been active measures by certain law enforcement agencies, let's say, that would generate kind of profiles based on the individual. Let's say that Stuart there on the front row has, you know, a total, uh, or a like for a particular type of individual that I've found out about based on his Pornhub search history. And so I doctor this profile with a particular profile picture and some interesting details that Stuart's going to look at and go, oh yeah, actually, yeah, oh, yeah. Do I like? Do I know them? Oh, I don't know because yeah, you know, I like that picture, so I'm going to like them. And straight away, you've got access to Facebook page. Some might argue that's not open source. It's a bit of a debate. I won't go into. Um, we've covered uh, Spotify, so I'm going to start flying now because I, I've been waffling. And TLDR, we all know what that is, right? Too long, didn't read. Yeah, we all know that when you kind of install iTunes and then you've got to accept the 76 page terms and conditions and do you actually read any of that? Usually that's where they just stuff all of this kind of thing. So it's quite interesting when you've got the time and if you're that way inclined, perhaps you should uh, take a look at the terms and conditions. But without further ado, I'll hand over to my colleague because uh, otherwise we're not going to have, have any time. Sure. Thanks, Nishan. That was excellent, actually. So benefits of data and before we do that I mean are you guys like just out of interest because generation Z most of you guys are in that 
era, I think, or that era of um, younger generation. Are you worried about all this data stuff? Uh, you know, I mean, before people say, well, I don't care, but I mean, now it's like becoming kind of reported. I mean, now you, I don't know if this, if you knew all this stuff, I mean, you know, we're, we're researching into a lot of this. We have a lot of areas we're looking into, but the more you look into it, the more scary it gets, to be honest with you, and you start to think, actually, I don't want to share anything. But we have to look at this. This is, uh, you know, the, the benefits of, 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 you know, data sharing in a good way as well. I mean, an easy one to look at is medical. Why? Because, you know, we can all put so many examples into this as, you know, basically, uh, your longitudinal medical history, everything from day one right till now, which could be a huge benefit if you're in control of it. Uh, meaning, you know, if I go to India next week, I have an accident, you know, as long as I'm conscious, I can actually say to them, guys, don't bother with all these x-rays and everything. Look, I busted my ACL some time ago. Be careful there. Here's all my history. Here is access to it without running every test or whatever medical condition you've got. But you need to be in control of it and you need to know that's the ownership word, right? Uh, interoperability, I mean, you know, all the silos of data. I mean, we came from physical records, which the only problem with physical records is if someone actually breaks in and steals and more building burns down. But now it's went to electronic records, which is great, but they're still held in silos. Still no good to everyone because no one's sharing data. So the interoperability is a key one between many organizations, many hospitals, many, uh, you know, in the whole ecosystem of medical care. Uh, Less duplication, re repeats of data, that's obvious. Streamlining infrastructure, again, that's obvious because that's all commercially beneficial, um, and I would say. End-to-end -end supply chain transparency, while it's commercially beneficial, you've got to look at also, it's actually beneficial to us because think about drug, the custody, the chain of custody for drugs, right? I mean, I'm talking about legal ones, yeah? And basically, you know, everything from its source, where it's manufactured, right through to supply. If it's not tracked, how do we know it's not counterfeit? We know that there's like, I can't even remember the exact stats, 10, 20% of all drugs out there are counterfeit, you know, legally. So, so that's a key thing. Um, and then if you look at the individual centric or patient centric approach I was talking about, making that person responsible themselves to actually who's accessing my data, um, as long as they can actually see that sort of chain of custody. Uh, smart infrastructure, we talk, told you about that Toronto project. Well, there are going to be many projects like that, and that's what I'm talking about, that data explosion. You've got no choice in that, and uh, that's going to interact with you, and you enter that zone. It knows you're there. In fact, you came here last week. Why don't you hire that chair over there in Cafe Nero and have that ca latte you usually have? How about, you know, it's all going to interact with you that way, so whether you like it or not. Um, law enforcement there, obviously for safety of, 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 you know, where we are, what our daily lives, let's say, so that's ob obvious there. Societal advancement and, and advertising, we'll skip through that. Um, so yeah, smart wearable data, really. So, I mean, there's going to be billions of devices, right? I mean, that's without a fact. Internet of Things is, is running that kind of like, um, ways forwards, I would say. Um, and there's this 27, 24 seven data collection process. So, you know, everything that, um, you know, no longer we need to talk to a patient. Basically, we can put a device on them and capture everything in the cloud and everything's seamlessly reported. So basically, what's the danger of that is, is, well, again, I don't have the ownership of it. The institution has ownership. That's fine. Uh, but I don't have any access to it and I don't have any control over it. Smart cities, uh, many third parties accessing this data and, you know, I don't want to cross too much of what Nishan said, but that's kind of what we're talking about there. But that, flexible approach I'm talking about. If we could have some control, then actually you could decide if you want to donate this data, data. Say like if I'm a diabetic and actually I want to really want to do something about this. I'm fed up with that condition. Maybe if I donate something uh, to pharmaceuticals in terms of my data, I don't even want a premium. A premium could be offered back to me, but I don't. I'm prepared to donate globally as a, a service. But one of the things I want back is maybe some something back in terms of knowledge. I get a report from the pharmaceutical. I get a report on conditions and globally in the world and the trends and what they're doing. So I'm not left in the dark. That I think would be significant. Um, yeah. So I don't know how many of you know or are aware of like the digital twin kind of methodology, right? So this is essentially what's happening right now and it's it's going to explode up because many reasons obviously one in terms of efficiencies and 
terms of like improvements in all sorts of things. But it's a connection between the physical and digital world and, you know, really essentially using Internet of Things. So, you know, NASA was the first to develop this technology in terms of simulation. What would it be like on Mars and all that sort of stuff? Um, so that it could actually preempt everything in advance. Um, you can, you know, create this virtual product process facility and all sorts. Um, as I say, a massive demand, you know, look, 16 billion is the market in 2023. Gartner's prediction is 21 billion connected sensors and endpoints. So, you know, it's huge. Benefits are there. It's real-time simulation. Particularly if we model it on a person, we could actually, uh, I would say, do something on individually uh, developing the drug specific to them, right? So there are the, those, those are the sorts of benefits you're talking about. Um, but if we look at what the ethical and privacy issues are, well, there's a, there's a lot there actually, because it might be actually a way of discriminating or lead to segmentation. Some it might not be accessible for. They may make decisions say, well, there's no point giving this to you because we've already assessed this all artificially. Um, you know, and how far do we go in terms of biohacking to improve ourselves and, you know, this therapy and human enhancement we're talking about, personalized medicines and so on. So I'll just skip through because I know I'm short on time. So data threat factors, I don't think I need to go into that much. You guys have seen some presentations today. You know who these kind of attackers are, what they do. You know, the individuals, the hiring malware as a service, state-sponsored attacks and, and so on. And the common methods, right? I mean, those are just a brand and bunch of methods, but they're the, they tend to be the most popular ones and phishing is still hugely successful. If you look at how they took down the critical national infrastructure in Ukraine in 2011 through a phishing attack, coordinated over many months, of course, because once you're in, you've got to find out all the passwords before you shut a power grid down. So that's the power of a state-sponsored attack. Um, and cyber attack landscape, quickly, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the, the main one that's getting hit is healthcare, primarily because it's premium data. Why? Because identity theft, right? So WannaCry was an obvious attack you guys all know about. We live in the UK and it was a disaster that weekend. And the power grid stuff. And of course, you know, what's the main combination? We did some correlation and some analysis from various sectors. But the main thing is malicious outsiders for the purpose of identity theft, right? So they're really targeting for identity theft. So if everything's held in trusted third parties, well, you know, the problem is it's like Swiss cheese in some, some operations. And including healthcare particularly, which is why that gets hit a lot. So what we're saying is what we could do about it. Well, there are some things like blockchain. I mean, I'm not advocating blockchain as a thing. There could be something else that comes along that is much better than that. But at the moment, it gives you that kind of like mutability, audibility, you know, gives you that increased security. Obviously, transparency protects that privacy and so on. How we do it? Well, there's a number of ways. And my kind of models are looking for industry. It's more in the permissioned and where data is held off the chain so that we can just have it as, I think, an auth authentication mechanism. So actually, pretty much that data is still held in uh, cloud and data lakes, but the only way to access this through it is through the blockchain. Um, and that's just a, one of the you know, quick model we're looking at. I mean, we've talked about healthcare records. Um, you know, we've talked about those benefits for patients and so on. And obviously, uh, commercially and all that side of it, all the way through to using blockchain. But in clinical trials, if you look at that, then this is a huge area where it, it really, transparency of data and ownership and all the issues with privacy are all kind of have, have a lot of problems. Um, everything from inform, setting up a trial to informed consent all the way to outcomes. Everything seems to be selectively reported and a lot of bias. You end up with drugs in the market that could have problems. Um, as Purdue Pharma, who are back in the newspapers again, 26 billion they've made and 200,000 people dead in the US because of opioid abuse. So, you know, that, that is a major issue. And identity then. So what is identity? Oh, there's just a Latin thing there, which means I think, therefore I am, cognito ergo sum. But basically it's a sum of attributes, obviously, what you are about as a person, the, you know, your characteristics, passport numbers and so on. And how we do it, there are a number of different ways. Um, and basically, how, we, how we're doing this at the moment is how do we interact with our identity? We give it everywhere because we have to. Insurance, home insurance, car insurance, whatever. Think about that. You have to give your details first as a quote to get a quote rather, before you can actually buy a service. Maybe I don't want these companies. I just did it recently myself because my wife forced me to do life insurance and I was running out of time and unfortunately 
I uh, didn't think too much into it and I put this data out there. Now I've got all sorts of phone calls, all sorts of emails and that's the disaster. So, so basically, um, a lot of people falsify their information now. I mean, I do on sites that you don't need to, where it's not official, right? Um, because what's the point of giving your real de name and date of birth? So basically, Another way of this current way of doing is this, what some guys in other presentations have said, obviously, is through Google or Facebook login, universal login. That sounds great. It's ease of access and all that kind of side of it. But then you've got the problems of obviously giving permissions to all the third party trackers, ad trackers and so on that now have access to all your data. You know, your, um, oops. Yeah. Sorry. That's it. Yeah. Just me with piddling around. Access to your name, you know, your birthday, and all that sorts of information. We talked about Cambridge Analytica, and that's exactly what happened on that one. So the future could be that. I mean, it could be a self-sovereign. I mean, basically, what we're saying there is, is uh, you don't need to rely on these third parties. You have a virtual, you have a real identity, you have a digital identity, you have a virtual identity, a number of virtual identities actually. And this is a concept that's been thought of out there. There are a number of companies looking at that. It is interesting. So if you take, a, for example, a bank, um, if you want to set up a bank account, I've been banking with Barclays since I've been 14 years old, um, why would I need to give all my details again to Lloyd's, for example? You've, you know I'm, I'm, I'm credible and, all, and so on, right? I'm just, you know, so just as an example of a bank name, not to say those two are particular, but, but if you could give your virtual identity, then that would suffice it because as far as that other bank, the new bank's concern is, they know that you're a bony fide person. You're credible and have the worthiness because your virtual identity has been obviously sanity checked in a sense of whoever, and whoever could be looking after this, it could be something like the future role of a bank. So these are some of the things that are being thought about. So in summary, because we can see if there's any questions, um, we can't stop the experiential growth, data growth. There's no way you're going to stop that. That's happening. Um, there are many benefits associated. I've talked about the interoperability, data interchange, data sharing, of course, with uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning. It's all got to get better and structured because 80% of the world's data is unstructured at the moment. So the more that we can help create that data, the more intelligent it will become. However, there's a greater exposure, as you've seen, to your privacy of data. Um, you know, the less transparency of how they or what uses they're going to do with your data, this data collection. And this dilution of ownership has already happened. It's already out there. Your name is already, you know, reused so many times and your details are reused so many times. So if we can't stop it, then perhaps we can have better control mechanisms, was my thought, uh, as a personal, you know, kind of view on this presentation. Um, you know, we need to look at the legal infrastructures and frameworks. That's something that government and and, you know, organizations need to do. But there could be some things like blockchain or digital identities and something we can all do ourselves to have that situational awareness of where and what we do with our data. As I gave you the bad example of what I did a month ago with my life insurance business, you know, trying to get a quote, which was just because I was in a hurry. So that is kind of like where we're at as the end of the presentation. Um, and I just, you know, to kind of like really Pull, pull us along to any questions or any thoughts you've got, or any comments, please go ahead and uh, any final thoughts from Nishan? I was going to say, I mean really, well, I think the whole point of this presentation and I think a lot of the other presentations that have been going on today, um, like with Becca's one uh, earlier about why users are expletive at uh, security, I think we're really talking about you know, privacy by design, security by design, obviously privacy by design is a GDPR thing. Um, but uh, you know, ethical by design. Really, we're trying to not just look at it from a mechanism point of view, or you know, put all the onus on companies and websites or whatever to make sure that their things are secure and that they do things in a particular way. But almost using that privacy or security by design concept in the way that we think and the way that we do things, and being aware of what's actually happening with our data and how it's being used. And you know, we might be happy to be giving certain sets of data. To, you know, in certain instances, but just being a bit more mindful of it, I suppose, really. But yeah, so that was a kind of a, a, a yeah, flying through a wall. So yeah, yeah. So, but, but it's all relevant in the sense of <coughs> data. It's there. It's key. I mean, that's why people are making so much money. About why do we see companies getting bought because they're selling some device? They're not. They're getting bought for the data that's behind it, right? So, so, do we have any questions? Yes. Mm. I mean, whatever you decide to give to one consciously, that's fine for you, but yep. it, it sounds 
to do that because they all want to move all their data. Mm. Because they don't work together, it's different companies. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially, what you're saying is that um, different companies are collating or building these data or these profiles based on your data. So whether it's in silo from Facebook or Google or Amazon or whoever, 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 and by themselves, that's fine because you give them certain data. But we're asking, so who is it that's actually looking at the whole overview? Um, government agencies, I suppose. Well I, well, I don't suppose. Well, actually, uh, companies that uh, swallow up a lot of other companies. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, so I think that's the thing. So, like Alpha, Al Alphabet Inc., for example, who own a lot of companies. So, even though these particular companies have certain snippets or certain kind of slices of your data pie, as it were, um, yeah, these larger kind of umbrella companies will then ha hold larger chunks. And then, if uh, I'm talking from a profiling point of view, so if you're thinking of law enforcement where you start kind of taking these sections and building this data profile, and obviously in if we're talking about kind of, uh, how do I phrase this, Western democracies let's say, where you trust the government and perhaps that's fine because everything's toward, but perhaps you're kind of, if you then think of a more dystopian future or governments where if they've got access to this kind of data, again I mentioned Shenzhen in China, purely because they're actually profiling people and seeing how they rank according to the communist ideal. Um, that's very dangerous, right? Because actually yeah. in, in hard work, you said, no one can replace them. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. And that's thing. But and, uh, exactly. And, 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 that's, and that's, where the, that's where the ethical by design kind of concept comes in about um, you know, ensuring, you know, and we're talking about democracy and everything else, but ensuring that the, 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 the powers at play, um, you know, making sure that, you know, they're governed appropriately so that if they're handling our data that they're doing it appropriately, right? But obviously, but we need to be aware about what's actually happening so then we can actually govern, you know, how it's being treated because otherwise if we don't know then it just it gets used and abused, I suppose, right? Yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I, I mean, yeah. I, yeah, it's fine. I mean, yeah, I mean, sorry, guys. I mean, I know I waffled on a lot. I mean, it, it is an interesting subject, but if, but yeah.